Judges chapter 12, Judges chapter 12. Judges chapter 12. Okay, so we're going to be looking at our next set of judges. Uh, last week, just review, we were looking at Jephthah, and in particular, we're looking at the fact that he had made a vow. Now, um, I can't hear you. No, that's right. Okay, we uh, looked at Jephthah last week, and then the vow that he had made. In particular, uh, one that was not appropriate or not fit or not within God's standard. And so we saw that it was not um, we do see also that um, I don't think it was pertaining to the vow in particular, but just the fact that he was somebody that was faithful to God. But he is mentioned in Hebrews 11 as having been somebody that had a uh, you know a history, or at least a recorded history of having been faithful to God. That he, he believed God, he trusted God, and so God counted him worthy to be not just an that annotated because of the fact that he had judged Israel, but also. Uh, to fall within the hall of faith. I mean, he's not the only one listed there, but he is listed. Uh, so Judges 12, um, towards the end, he, following the fact that, good morning, we're in uh, Judges 12. This is kind of a tail end of it. After he already sacrifices his daughter, um, And the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and went northward and uh, said unto Jephthah, Wherefore passeth thou over to fight against the children of Ammon, and didst not call us to go with thee, we will burn thine house upon with fire, upon thee with fire. And Jephthah said unto them, I and my people were at great strife with the children of Ammon, and when I called you, ye delivered me not in, uh, out of their hands. And then when I saw that you were uh, that you delivered me not. I put my I put my life in my in my hand and passed over against the children of Ammon, and the Lord delivered them into my hand. Wherefore then art thou come up unto me this day to fight against me? Uh, so he brings up a, a reasonable argument. The fact is, why would that be something that they would want to fight him and kill him over? Uh, as far as their brethren, so to speak. They're not within the same tribe because uh, uh, Jephthah was of Gilead and then he was, uh, the, the men that were coming up against him, though they're a neighboring tribe, uh, they're, they're from Ephraim, even though they're all Israelites. So they passed over uh, neighboring territories to go ahead and fight the fight that they, now if we were to go back and review basically, uh, the Ammonites had come against Israel, all of Israel in particular, but uh, to Gilead in particular. So the Gileadites were the ones that were causing, that were in the battle. Nothing is mentioned of any of the other tribes within there, uh, within that accounting. Just simply that it was Gilead that was fighting children of Ammon, uh, but they would have been going against all of Israel. So now they cross over. They go ahead and take take care of uh, business. Basically, God gives them the victory. You know, He sacrifices his daughter, and whatnot. And so now you have this tribe that takes issue with the fact that. They weren't called to the battle. Why, you know, what's the big deal with that? Why, uh, why would they even have issue with that to begin with? And it seems silly. It looks like two things, you know. People that are cowards bluster a lot, and if they had, if they had a desire to go to battle, been to war, they'd have been there. But there are a lot of people that, after the fact, say I would have, I say what they would have done, and. Uh, easy. They didn't do anything to Jephthah. 
So to me, it just looks like it's just a bluster. Like it's just a lot of talk about this is what we would have done. Now we're going to burn you with fire, like they can, like they had the courage to burn Jephthah. You know when they <laughs> when they needed him to deliver them. But that's my opinion. It's a bluster. I'm going to conjecture. I don't know that this would be fact, but they'll say you would have possibly spoils of war that you have um, whenever somebody goes to battle, you're victorious, you're, you, you beat them, you know, they're killed off, then you go ahead and spoil, are able to go ahead and take the spoils. Like in order you're able to take the land, if it's a proprietary dispute, or <coughs> you can take whatever's left over the remnant from the dead bodies. And then from within that region, if you're coming against a city or a township, um, or whatnot, so it could be, again, there's, it's not really indicating as to why that would be the case that they would have issue with it, but they had enough issue to want to go ahead and fight. Uh, we see here that, um, uh, verse 4 says, When Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim, and then the men of Gideon, the men of Gilead smote Ephraim because they had said, uh, You Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim among the Ephraimites and among uh, the Manassites. This is going to be pretty fun. Well, I, I find it amusing. Uh, verse 5, And the Gileadites took the passages of Jordan before the Ephraimites. And it was so, mind you, Gilead's on the other side, so they're having to... <laughs> they're fighting. River Jordan would be uh, Israel's eastern boundary, or at least middle to south of the country. And then you have further up north into like what would be uh, Sea of Galilee, or Lake Tiberias. And, and then you got the Golan Heights, whatever the, the hills, the hill country up north. <clears throat> but they don't have any territory with the exception of that immediate adjacent on the other side of the river because you have, whenever they were coming in, that tribe that they want to cross over. Uh, and then obviously rebuked uh, by Joshua. So they cross over, and so now they have, um, basically they, they've secured uh, the passageways crossing over from the river. And then, um, and it was so that when those Ephraimites, which were escaped, said, let me go over, that the men of Gilead said unto them, uh, art thou Ephraimite? If he said nay, then they would say unto him, say now Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth, for he could not frame to pronounce it right. And then they took him and they slew him at the passages of Jordan. And there fell at that time Ephraimites, uh, of the Ephraimites, 40 and 2,000. So Jephthah judged Israel six years and died. Jephthah the Gileadite was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. So we see outside of the fact that he killed his daughter in a human sacrifice, there's nothing really negative said you know, about Jephthah. He makes it into the Hall of Faith. Uh, he served God within his time. Uh, he was faithful to point people towards God. Uh, during during his during his reign as a judge. Now we're going to see three succeeding judges towards the end of the chapter here. Verse 8, And after him, Isbun of Bethlehem judged Israel, and he had thirty sons and thirty daughters, whom he sent abroad, and took in thirty daughters from abroad for his sons, and he judged Israel seven years. Then died Isbun and was buried in Bethlehem, uh, at Bethlehem. Then after him, Elon, a Zebulonite, judged Israel, and he judged Israel ten years. And Elon the Zebulonite died and was buried in Ajalon in the country of Zebulon. And after him, Abdon the son of Hillel, a Pirathonite, judged Israel. And he had forty sons and thirty nephews that rode on thirty, uh, three score and ten ascolts, and he judged Israel eight years. And Abdon the son of Hillel, the Parathonite, died and was buried in uh, Parathon in the land of Ephraim in the Mount of the Amalekites. Right, so you have three people that are mentioned here that judged Israel for, it seems, relatively small period of time. Uh, first one being Isman, and he judged Israel for seven years. Then Elon, he judged Israel for ten years. Then after him, Abdon, and he judged Israel for eight years. Uh, and not much is really said. Elon being the one that's least said about, just other than this is where he's from, this is what he did, and then he was 
buried after he died at this location. So you have three people from different tribes uh, that judged Israel uh, for short periods of time. Now you're saying, okay, what's uh, <laughs> what's significant about this? I was honestly having a hard time as far as like trying to figure out, okay, what can we learn from these people with regard to just anything that we would be benefited spiritually by? Uh, with because really, there's not much is mentioned about them. Here's who they are. Here's where they came from. Here's what they did, and they died. That's it. You know, and then Elon being the most succinct of what's mentioned. Yes. Uh, something you might want to uh, do is judge. Write down where they're from. See if there's any of the um, tribes that were not mentioned we're, as ha having judges. We'll we'll go into that a little bit, not this lesson, but the next lesson. Um, these are Judges 9, 10, and 11, or 10, 11, 12, I'm sorry. You have, for the most part, most every tribe represented so far uh, as having had a judge come out from them. Even so, Dan? Uh, yes, Hello. we will have, not yet. Oh. <laughs> that's coming, actually, yeah, that's gonna be Samson. Samson, yeah. But they're going to have, every, pretty, for the most part, every tribe is going to be represented. I don't think Levi is, uh, but most every tribe is going to have had a judge come out from them to have represented Israel at some point within the span of when uh, Israel is a judge under judges. Uh, but so now we have these individuals that are named. Here's what they did. Here's where they're from, and when they died, here's where they were buried. So, not much is mentioned. They're just kind of, it seems like a blip, right? If you were to have a timeline, okay, you get this kind of small blip, and it's not, it doesn't seem very significant as compared to some of the other ones that you have, like Jephthah, uh, two chapters. Um, you'll have Gideon that was mentioned, at least three chapters reference to him. Uh, Samson's going to have a number more as well, but we, we haven't got to him yet. So what can we learn? Okay, here's two things that I came up with. <laughs> I didn't necessarily come up with them, they're not original to me, but this is that, that really kind of stood out. First off, is that they serve God in their time. They serve God in their time, and that is in their lifetime, in, in the generation that they were at, uh, where they found. Uh, we are not told how they were called, who called them. Uh, Jephthah in particular, it was not even God that called him. It was an angel sent to him. It was the men of Gilead that sought him out after he was basically exiled, in a sense. They didn't want him around because he was the son of a harlot. And they're like, well, you're not gonna have uh, inheritance with us. You know, you're not even really part of us. And then so he went to go to the land of Tob. And it wasn't until they found themselves in a position where they were in need, and they went to God to seek deliverance. God said, hey, I'm through with you guys. I'm not even going to bother dealing with you anymore. And uh, they went and sought him out. Now, it's pretty interesting that they would seek him out, and they would know to seek him. Why was it that uh, he was out of the whole tribe, or out of any of the other tribes, but why in particular was it that he was sought out? Not even, I mean, honestly, it wasn't God that did it. I mean, God used him. The Spirit of God came upon him, you know, and he judged and delivered Israel, but he was sought out by the men of Gilead who initially rejected him. That said, we don't want you to have inheritance with us. You won't have that because you're a son of a harlot. And, uh, you know, you, don't, you, you really don't belong here. You don't belong with us. Why, you know, what was it about him in particular that would cause him in a Gilead to go and seek him out? It seems like he was he he had the gift of meekness. Uh, they this is really interesting about Jephthah because they have the courage. Individuals have the courage after he has literally destroyed the wicked or destroyed destroyed the, literally delivered them, and they have the courage to approach him and say. 
you know, you should have asked us to go with you. Uh, and they also had the courage, his brethren had the courage to say, you don't have a part of our inheritance, leave here. But it's very, very evident about Jephthah that you know, he's, he's no Gideon when he gets to be called. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't have to test the fleece. He's, he's, he totally has courage. You know, he, does, he has confidence. Okay, this needs to be done. I'll do it. He doesn't need, you know, confirmation of the call or whatever. He's a guy that he's, he's not afraid to die. He's not afraid to fight. And to me, I see this Jephthah as a mighty man. A man that <clears throat> when you're growing up with him, if you're going to wrestle, he can beat all the brothers. You know, but he's that, he's that great big guy with a really... Um, Easy going attitude. You know, the guy that's stronger and uh, more athletic and uh, can fight, but doesn't have that aggression in him, doesn't have that meanness or that rivalry. Now, how else do you explain a guy being told by his brethren, you don't have part in our inheritance? He knew who his daddy was. He, his father was his father just as much as as, they, as he was their father. You know, he couldn't help it what his circumstances were, a lot of guys wouldn't take that. Jephthah said, you don't want me, I don't want you, I'm out of here. You know, he just had that spirit about him. Uh, where he, So, to me, they had to know he was a bad dude in that sense. They had to know, you know, Jephthah, if Jephthah wanted to, he could take care of those people. And then they ask him, and he just does. You know, so to me, this is that, this is that guy who could uh, outmatch anybody but doesn't for no reason. In other words, he has to have a cause. He's meek. You know, that's that really is the definition of meekness, strength under control. And I just think that they knew they knew he had the ability. Uh, and you know, because he, he probably loved them. He cared about them because of that. When they ran him out of town, he left town because he didn't want to hurt them. And uh, so there's a lot of pictures of Jephthah's mannerism and his attitudes really embodies what a, a man is, what a real man is. Not a guy that has to prove himself, but a guy that's proven, but is very, very gentle. He doesn't he doesn't use his strength for no reason. So I, that's, that's what I, as I read him, that's what it looks like. He's described initially in Scripture as... <clears throat> Now, Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor. Yeah. That, that's his initial description by God of him. So now, he's like a David kind of a guy, really. Yeah, or any of his mighty men. Now, the idea of valor isn't just that he's courageous, but it, it's somebody of integrity, that he has integrity, he has character. He has that parallels a good one, too, because if you remember, God didn't send David to fight Goliath. David said, why isn't somebody doing something? You know, is there, is there not a cause? What? And, you know, I mean, he's, Saul should have fought Goliath. David's brother should have fought Goliath. All the men of Israel should have fought Goliath, but they wouldn't. David said, well, somebody needs to do this. And, man, I'll tell you, these guys like this, are they're once in a generation. You don't meet many people that see a need and say a need seen as a task assigned. I don't need a special call from God you know, to stir me up from my apathy if I care. You know, and I mean, there's there's a major lesson in just the way, obviously God anointed David to be king of Israel, but God didn't say to David, you know, go to the battlefield and check out all the cowardly men and fight Goliath and a great spirit will come upon you. know, David knew that God was there. When, when there was something to be done, you think, you don't need for God to give you some kind of confirmation. You do something as a believer. When something ought to be done, and you look at it, you ought to do it. And we, we have all kinds of believers that want some kind of, uh, they want to be led, you know, carry me into doing something. And what we really need is people that just, that are men of action. And say, this ought, this ought to be done. Somebody ought to do it, I will. Some, somebody else isn't going to, I'm going to do it. If somebody else doesn't say something, I'll say something. Somebody else doesn't do something, I'll do something. You know, and we live in a society of people, it's, it's, a, it's difficult to understand, but they, they want a hero, they don't want to be a hero. You know, they want to follow someone, but they don't want to lead anyone. 
Now, sometimes they're rebellious and don't want to follow, but they also all leave. Jephthah's the guy that said, okay, I'll do it. And he's, he's quite a man. Yeah. And along with the other three, the following, the three following, now, all we have, we don't even have really descriptions other than where they're from. Um, two of them we do have some measure. Okay, you have Isben. He's mentioned as having 30 sons and 30 daughters. Okay, so he's got 60 kids. Yeah, he sends... He <laughs> sends his daughters abroad. Yeah. Now, the abroad here, they are... Let's see, he's in Zebulon. Okay? So he is in Israel, but he's in particular within his allotment in Zebulon. Abroad would be out of country, being out of Zebulon, so neighboring, or just out of country within out of Israel altogether, out of all of region of Israel altogether. But where would they go? It's not like they had ties back to, say, um, like even Jacob had to their, their previous homeland, going back to Ur of Chaldees or going back into Mesopotamia. So more than likely it'd be just, okay, he sent them abroad as far as the neighboring, what would be abroad out of, out of within Zebulon, but it'd still be within Israel. But nevertheless, okay, so he has 60 kids and 30 of them which are daughters. And he has obviously sufficient amount of money to be able to go ahead and have them be sent abroad. And also to have daughters from abroad to be brought for his sons to be able to marry. So, you know, this guy is of some means uh, to be able to care for that. Same is mentioned of, well, to some degree, not uh, of Abdon. Okay, so he's mentioned as having 40 sons and then 30 nephews. Okay, so he's another one that's got a lot of kids. And then in particular, it says that they have um, the, the donkeys, the young donkeys. Um, not quite baby donkeys, but young donkeys uh, to ride on. So all 70 of them have donkeys on which to ride, and they go ahead and ride. So they have, there are some means. They have some substance to them. As far as financially, they have make a great headbelly song. <laughs> they're not the only ones. That's the funny thing that, that, that that's mentioned. That same as far as accounting, where they have a large number of kids where they all ride on donkeys, um, or the colts, the colts of donkeys to go ahead and have as their means of transportation. So I'm, I'm not sure what the appeal is of them, but I've written it on them, but I'd rather have a horse because they can go a lot faster. But I guess the donkey is useful as far as because they can carry a lot more weight. They're, they're way more sure but they can go places the horse can't go. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, is it because of their size or? They're just more sure footed. You can go up a trail, they can just go, it's like a goat, you know, goats can go places. Other animals can't. Diverse things. Also, I strength. So you got two guys that are mentioned that have means. Now they're not related. They're not other than that they're Israelites, uh, but they're from different tribes. Uh, you have another one mentioned, Elon here, but other than just where he's from, that he was born, he judged Israel, and then he died. Uh, <coughs> So here's the thing. They serve God in their time. Why would you want to serve God as a judge? Or in other words, why would you want to be a judge? What would drive somebody to, what would motivate somebody to want to be a judge? The need. Have sense of justice. That's the necessity of it. See the need for right living? Now, okay, who wants to be president of the U.S.? Donald Trump. No, no, not I. Yeah. Everyone, you know, it's kind of the same, similar thing. Okay, you're responsible for making sure that Israel, it's primarily spiritual, mind you. If you look at a judge, they were brought up to deliver Israel from an enemy, so you're always going to be brought in at a time of crisis, and usually it's going to be as a result, actually it is as a result, it's a direct result of being in a very low spiritual condition, a 
Okay, so you have everybody that doesn't want to serve God is out there worshiping idols, and then you're responsible for turning that whole thing around. In other words, you're responsible for getting Israel back on track spiritually and also to physically deliver them from whoever is oppressing them. Uh, that means your guys are going to be uh, probably in a very big deficit financially. Uh, more than likely, you would have been in a very long period of time where your resources would have been plundered. You would have been probably in drought, possibly famine. You would have had uh, just very, very, very poor conditions uh, living, living wise, besides the fact that you would live in fear and any number of things that would be uh, going on that would, would be negatively affecting. So here you have three different guys from different, three different locales within Israel uh, that basically step up and say, okay, hey, here I am. You know, I'm ready for this job. <laughs> it's, it's, you're not coming into a pretty position. In other words, you're coming into a position that is everything is messed up and you got to fix it. Okay, you're not you're not walking in to where it's nice. You're walking into some place that's completely a wreck, a mess. And for the most part, everybody's going to be working against you because they don't want they want to be delivered. But in a sense, they really don't because they really want in their heart, deep down in their heart, they want idols. So you got <laughs> it's rather stressful. Okay. So, again, who would want that? Obviously, it would be somebody that has enough spiritual discernment and concern, and besides just love of country, has a love for God that says, hey, this is not right. We need to be on right track and right standing. So regardless of the opposition that we would have, beyond just the fact that we have to deliver from enemies that want to destroy us, uh, this needs to get done. So they, they prioritize and they realize, okay, not just beyond the fact that there's a need uh, which is most prominent, and that that's that's a driving force, obviously. But the fact that if we don't, you know, we're not we're bringing down the name of God. Okay, Israel throughout its history, <coughs> they were supposed to be glorifying God. In other words, they we're supposed to be representing God as who He was to not just obviously within the nation, but also to those without. So the neighboring nations were supposed to see God for who he was, how he was like in reality. All right? And what they're doing is they're, they're, um, they're, they're, they're pointing like a distorted image of who God really is to everybody else. So God can't really be known or seen for who, he's, for who he is, what he's like, uh, because the vessel that is supposed to be representing him is not you know, basically, they're not they're not following through on what he had for them to do. Uh, so you have these men step up. So they served God in their time, in their lifetime. Uh, there was a need that drove them, and they had the integrity, and they had the love for God to go on and say. And they had obviously they would have to have had a relationship with God. Now it wasn't like these men are without fault; they're sinners just as we are, uh, and then some of their faults are recorded for us to be able to go ahead and see that we can learn from as well. Um, but uh, ultimately they have a motivating factor that says, okay, God, you need to be known. Uh, you're, you're paramount. You're first and foremost. And then also the second thing is that they prove God's truth in Proverbs 22.1. Proverbs 22.1. And that says that a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. Okay, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and Proverbs it also states that the just man walketh his walketh in his integrity and then his children are blessed after him. Um, these men I believe were chosen because of the character that they had, the integrity that they would have had. Um, again, it wasn't like they weren't without fault, it wasn't like they were sinless, it wasn't like they lived the entirety of their life. A lot of them did, but it wasn't like they lived the entirety of their life. Uh, walking for God, though the majority of the time that they did, um, a lot of there's a few of them that ended up finishing poorly uh, because of bad decisions that they made later on in life, uh, and then the repercussions of which would affect not just them but also their kids and also affect the nation really poorly. Uh, but they do prove God's truth that a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. Now again. 
some of these men were wealthy, some of them were not very wealthy, and regardless of the fact was when they died, what did they take with them? Uh, I know it seems kind of a silly question, but they didn't take anything with them. Yeah. And we're in 2018, right? And actually halfway through. <laughs> halfway through 2018 now. Uh, and we're talking about these guys that were at least, what, uh, three, 4,000 years ago that were alive. And, you know, what do you think they're thinking about? Oh man, I wish I could have, uh, you know. 71, 71 donkeys. <laughs> <laughs> I had just one more daughter to send abroad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not like we don't have responsibilities here and now on earth that we need to tend to and take care of, you know, and be, you know, good stewards of. Uh, but, you know, it, Set our affections on things above and not on things of this earth because our life is hidden with Christ, you know, and God. And so the thing is, uh, where your treasure is, there where your heart be also. Here and now is going to come and pass. Again, it's not that you be irresponsible and don't be a good steward. Uh, but the fact is, the only thing you could be able to take with you was what's done for Christ. And the only thing you're really going to leave behind <laughs> is your good name. You know, that's what's going to follow. And if you're walking in your integrity, uh, those that follow after, uh, Lord willing, if they follow in that, then they will be blessed after you. In other words, so you uh, seek not just to be a good steward and such, but, you know, leave a good name. Leave a good name. Uh, you know, a good name is rather be chosen than great riches. And then serve God in your time serve God in your time. The only thing we can do now uh, to affect eternity is in our service to God. And that's daily yielding, daily seeking Him, uh, and daily being obedient to the promptings and then to what He's given us to do. Uh, if we're living like that daily, step by step, as He guides, and then when we're done, whether it's because we, you know, we die of natural causes or die of violent death or God just comes and takes us, then you know we can look back on our life, and we would hopefully hear, you know, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Uh, first Peter, go to First Peter. Actually, Second Peter. I'm sorry. Second Peter. Starting at verse 3 in chapter 1, 2 Peter says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped corruption that is in the world through lust, or the corruption. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For these things be in you and abound, okay, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, but he that thought of these things is blind and cannot see afar off and have forgotten that he, he was purged from his old sins. Okay, and then wherefore the rather brethren give diligence and make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, uh, you shall never fall. And then here's, a, here's the point, verse 11, it says, For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord Jesus, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay, for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom. All right, so we know it's when Christ returns, when he comes back, or when we are ushered in, um, be appointed death, or um, at the rapture, if we would have been abounding uh, in the in not only in our personal development as far as our character and integrity, uh, but our knowledge of the Lord Jesus and in our submission, our, uh, our giving ourselves over to Him and to His, to His cause and His work, uh, then that's, you know, gold, silver, precious stone rather than wood, hay, stubble that'll stand to fire whenever that's tested, but also that, hey, well done, 
well done. Okay, that's a life well pleasing. Again, that's not a call to irresponsibility here, uh, but the fact is a proper priority, proper perspective of that which is eternal um, will cause us to obviously be diligent here about not only our our responsibilities here that kind of would you feel kind of tie us down if we take care of those and then that frees us up to be able to go ahead and focus and give attention to uh, the eternal things, seeking out you know lost folks and then uh, doing good as, as, as uh, we're admonished constantly in scripture that, uh, that we be careful to do uh, good works. So from these judges we learn we are to serve God in our time and then we are to prove God's truth or actually, it's already been proved, but rather seek to that, for that to be true of us, that a good name is rather be chosen than great riches. All right. Does anybody have any questions? All right. So next week, we're going to be starting into our next judge, and that is Samson, looking at Samson's life. Don, we're dismissed. Thank you.